My subject today is philosophy and biography, and in particular I'll be talking about um, the biography and the philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein and my experience of writing a biography of him. And in the process I'll be defending, so to speak, the biography of philosophers, but in a, in a limited sort of way. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, some people don't like biography, and they don't like biography for some fairly good reasons, I think, to do with the devaluation of the work. So a general claim that you need to know somebody's life in order to understand their literary work or in order to understand their philosophical work, that general claim is, quite rightly, I think, rejected and, and held in suspicion. Um, so I'm not going to defend that, that general... I'm not going to defend the view that, you know, you need to understand somebody's life in order to understand their philosophy. What I am going to defend is the view that, in some cases, and I think Wittgenstein is a preeminent case... In some cases, it helps to know what kind of person a philosopher was. Not in all cases. I don't think it much helps to understand, you know, Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem to know what kind of person Kurt Gödel was. I don't think that helps very much at all. But I do think it helps in Wittgenstein's case to know what kind of person he was. In particular, I think that helps in warding off some widespread misunderstandings of Wittgenstein. Okay, so let me say a little bit about who Wittgenstein was, because it's possible, I think, there are some people who don't know uh, that. Uh, Wittgenstein was an Austrian philosopher, generally, I think, regarded, certainly in the analytic tradition, as the most important philosopher of the 20th century, or at least he would be in everybody's top five. Um, he was born in Vienna in 1899, to a fabulously wealthy family. His father virtually owned the iron and steel industry of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they had palatial houses. Uh, he once told somebody that the house in which he grew up in Vienna had seven grand pianos in it. It was uh, a big house. Um, and he came from a big family. Um, however, and, and it was, a, it was a, a family at the heart of cultural life in Vienna, at a particularly exciting period of its development. This is the period in which uh, the Jugendstil movement is developing in, in art with, with, with Klimt and Kokoschka. Uh, you have exciting new developments in architecture with Adolf Loos. Um, you have uh, Freud developing psychoanalysis, um, experiments going on in, in, in writing. This was, you know, the, the period at the turn of the 20th century was a tremendously exciting period in Viennese cultural life where, where a lot of the movements that would then dominate European artistic and cultural life were being developed in Vienna. And a lot of them being developed in Wittgenstein's house. Um, uh, 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 Klimt, for example, did a painting of Wittgenstein's sister. Uh, the, the same sister Gretel was a close friend of, of Freud uh, Brahms used to come and play uh, music in the Wittgenstein house so the Wittgenstein house was right at the centre of these artistic and cultural developments the other thing to understand about the Wittgenstein family is that it was a family marked by tragedy Wittgenstein's eldest brother Hans was a, was a, a, a musical genius of Mozartian uh, proportions. Uh, he, was, he was playing the piano, uh, uh, you know, at the age of four. He was composing music at the age of five. However, his father wanted him to uh, continue to run the iron and steel industry in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Hans had no intention of doing that. Hans ran away to, to, to America and uh, committed suicide. Shortly after that, the second brother, Rudolf, also committed suicide. Uh, this time in Berlin, uh, Rudolf was gay, and he, one day he walked into a, a gay bar in Berlin and shot himself in front of, in front of everybody. Remarkably, v v Ludwig Wittgenstein, the, the Wittgenstein I'm concerned with, had yet another brother who committed suicide. This was Kurt Wittgenstein much later in the First World War, uh, Kurt Wittgenstein, like Ludwig Wittgenstein, fought for the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the First World War, and towards the end of the war, 
uh, Kurt, Kurt, who was an officer, his troops uh, refused to obey his command, whereupon he too committed suicide. So, there's this family, it's tremendously wealthy, it's right at the heart of exciting artistic and cultural developments, but there's an air of tragedy marking it. Now, Wittgenstein himself would, did not have, he, he always had a, an acute appreciation of music, but he wasn't himself a musician or a musical, certainly not a musical genius. He developed an interest in engineering, much to his father's delight. Um, and he went to study engineering first in, 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 in Berlin, then in Manchester, and this is 1908 now, uh, in the early days of aerodynamics. And Wittgenstein in Manchester designed a jet engine. That was his, that was his main project um, in the very early days of aircraft design. It turned out that designing the, the, designing the, the, the jet engine uh, d required particular attention to be made to the design of the propellers, which turned out to be a mathematical task, and so he started attending mathematics classes in Manchester, given by the famous mathematician Littlewood. And that got him very interested in what mathematics was. He asked himself, well, what, what is mathematics? What are mathematical objects? What are numbers? And somebody pointed him in the direction of Bertrand Russell's work on this question. Bertrand Russell, a few years earlier, had published Principles of Mathematics, in which he gave an answer to these questions. The answer was that numbers are classes. Lot, where, where, where a class is a logical object. So we, we, you know, Aristotle's logic deals with classes, the class of men, the class of horses. Russell developed a theory that saw a number as a class of classes. And it worked very well until Russell himself discovered two things. One is that he'd been preempted in this by a German mathematician called Gottlob Frege. And two, the, the whole system that he developed fell apart because of a contradiction that is now known as Russell's paradox. And I'll explain the contradiction uh, quickly. Uh, don't worry if you don't get it. Um, don't don't worry if it's gibberish. Uh, just 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 go with me. Right. The um, all right. Here's Russell's paradox. There are some classes, Russell says, that belong to themselves. The class of all classes belongs to itself because it is a, it is a class. Most classes don't belong to themselves. The class of men is not itself a man. The class of horses is not itself a horse. So some classes don't belong to themselves. All right, so group all those together. And now what have you got? You've got the class of all classes that do not belong to themselves. And now you ask, does that class belong to itself or not? Now if it does... It shouldn't do, because it's the class of all classes that don't belong to themselves. If it doesn't belong to itself, then it should do, because it's the class of all classes that don't belong to themselves. So you have a paradox. Now you might say, so what? Well, that paradox persuaded Russell that his whole theory of classes didn't work and couldn't work. So what he did, he, he published Principles of Mathematics outlining his theory that numbers were classes and that therefore mathematics was logic, but also spelling out this problem, the problem of Russell's paradox. Wittgenstein, studying engineering, developing an interest in mathematics, reads this book and becomes absolutely obsessed with finding a philosophical answer to this problem that Russell has encountered. So being Wittgenstein, he doesn't sign any forms or make any applications. He just went straight down to Cambridge and starts following Bertrand Russell around. He went into, uh, uh, into uh, 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 Trinity College, Cambridge, where Russell was. And when Russell gave a lecture, Wittgenstein was there. And when Russell was, you know, preparing for dinner, Wittgenstein was there. And Russell thought he was mad. Um... And at the end of that term, Wittgenstein said to Russell, I'm not sure whether I should resume my engineering studies or whether I should concentrate on philosophy. I don't know uh, whether I'm stupid or not. 
And Russell said to him, well, I don't know whether you're stupid enough, uh, stupid or not either. Why don't you write something over the Christmas vacation, show it to me, and then we'll decide. So Wittgenstein did that. He wrote something which hasn't been preserved but was about logic. Russell read it and said to Wittgenstein, no, you mustn't uh, go back to Manchester or to, to, to aeronautics. You must uh, stay in Cambridge and be a philosopher. And that's what happened. And Wittgenstein then worked on logic. Now, where does my defense of biography come in? Here, that to understand the work that Wittgenstein then produced, I think it really helps to know what kind of person Wittgenstein was. And I'll try and explain why. Okay, so he's working on logic. In particular, he thought that Russell, although he gave an answer to the question, what is mathematics, he hadn't thought seriously enough about the question, what is logic? And Wittgenstein thought that once you understood what logic was, then you understood that all the attempts to provide a theory of logic were a waste of time. Because logic, Wittgenstein says, is all about form. And form cannot be expressed. So thinking about logic, Wittgenstein distinguished what one can express and what one can't express. And logical form is something one can't express. Sentences have logical form, but they can't express logical form because they need logical form to express anything. So it's a bit like trying to jump on your, your own shadow. You can't do it. Every time you jump, your shadow moves. So he said, the, the understanding of logical form begins with the perception that logical form is, as he put it, transcendental. It can't be expressed. So he distinguished between what you can say and what you can show. Logical form, he says, shows itself. You can't say it, you can't express it, but you can see it. It shows itself. So there's a difference between what you can say and what you can show. At that point, Wittgenstein had to interrupt his work. He'd been working, he'd been working in Cambridge with Russell, and then he decide, decided that Cambridge was too nice and he was spending too much time enjoying himself in, in, in Cambridge with, with other people. So he had a house built on the edge of a field in Norway and he spent a year working in this house alone on his theory of logic. At that point, however, the First World War broke out and he felt obliged to volunteer for the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for the Austro-Hungarian Army. So he did, and he fought. And he, he, in the meantime, he'd read a book by William James called The Varieties of Religious Experience, in which James talked about a conversion experience and quoted many people as saying they'd undergone that experience in the face of death. Or in any case, that in facing death, they had improved themselves. And Wittgenstein wanted very much to do that. So he enlisted in the army partly because he wanted the experience of facing death. The authorities, however, seeing that he was a member of the very wealthy and influential Wittgenstein family, kept putting him in a safe position behind the lines, and he kept applying to be moved. And they thought they want, he wanted an even safer position, so they moved him further and further back. <laughs> Eventually, they got what he was wanting, and they moved him to the most dangerous place uh, in the First World War, the Russian Front. And he fought in the Russian Front from 1916 to 1917 in the he some of the heaviest fighting in the First World War. During that time, he worked on his logic, amazingly enough. But he also had a single book. He bought a single book in a bookshop. It only had one book, and that book was Leo Tolstoy's Gospel in Brief. He bought this book and he, he read it so often he virtually memorized it. Now, up until that point, he hadn't been, he hadn't had any religious belief. He'd had, so to speak, a religious attitude, as witnessed by his reaction to William James, but he had no religious belief. When he read Tolstoy's Gospel in Brief, he said he started to see the meaning of life. Now, remember this dis distinction before the First World War between those things that one can say and those things that one has to show. That distinction had been made in thinking about logic, but he now extended that distinction to all sorts of other things, including ethics, aesthetics, religion, the meaning of life. His view now was, there is indeed an answer to the question of the meaning of life, but you can't say it. 
And so he wrote a book, five-sixths of which is a theory of logic, and the final sixth is an application of that theory to ethics, aesthetics, religion, the meaning of life, and what he called the mystical. So he outlines what one can and cannot say. He then says that one cannot say these really deep truths. And he ends by saying, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. By the time he'd finished this book, he himself was a prisoner of war. Uh, The Russians, having had their revolution, uh, pulled out of the First World War. The Austrians then sent their forces over to the Italian front, the Italians having switched sides. And... Wittgenstein ended up in an Italian prisoner of war camp uh, at the end of the First World War. And that's where he finished his manuscript. And he wrote in the manuscript that he'd solved all philosophical problems. He wasn't a modest man, Wittgenstein. (laughs) He solved all philosophical problems. But here he was in a prisoner of war camp and no one was reading his solution. So he managed to smuggle a letter to Russell saying, I've written a book that solves all our problems come and get it so Russell knew Keynes Keynes was undergoing was part of the British uh, 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 team that was negotiating the peace terms Keynes pulled a few strings could have got Wittgenstein out of the camp but Wittgenstein refused to do that Um, but anyway managed to release the manuscript the manuscript wouldn't have been published without Russell's help Russell made sure that the, the, the manuscript was published And eventually Wittgenstein came out of the prisoner of war camp and went to Vienna. Now, the manuscript became the book that was given a a strange Latin title, Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, a a logico-philosophical tract. It was, the the name was suggested by the Cambridge philosopher G.E. Moore. Uh, Wittgenstein's title to it was a more prosaic German title, Das Satz, which just means the sentence or the proposition. But he he went with this Latin title. And it was published in 1921. By which time Wittgenstein, he really did believe he'd solved all philosophical problems. And so believing that he'd solved all philosophical problems, he just gave up philosophy, because after all there was nothing left to do in philosophy. So he gave up philosophy and he trained to be an elementary school teacher. Because he thought that's where he could do some good. And he was an elementary school teacher in tiny villages in, in what's called Lower Austria, in the, the, the countryside around Vienna. And he was a hopeless school teacher because he had ridiculous expectations of his pupils. He thought they could understand symbolic logic and all they wanted to do was leave school early and work on their farms and, and, and so on. So it didn't work out. But in the meantime, his book was acquiring a great reputation. Now here's where it's relevant to talk about misunderstandings of Wittgenstein. Okay, the book was published in English and in German, and two separate groups of people were inspired by it, one group in Cambridge and the other group in Vienna. Both of them were excited by Wittgenstein's analysis of logic and dismissed what he'd said about the mystical or about religion. And in particular, the Vienna group of philosophers, who were called the, 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 the logical positivists, the Vienna circle of logical positivists, they were developing a view which they thought was just an, uh, an elaboration of Wittgenstein's view, which they called the scientific world view. And it was part of the scientific world view to analyse language in such a way as to say all meaningful propositions, all meaningful sentences can be verified empirically by looking at the world. So there are scientific sentences and then there's the rest and the rest is all rubbish. So any attempt in philosophy to say something about ethics or aesthetics or religion from the logical positivist point of view was meaningless and therefore rubbish. And it's that and therefore, I think, that's significantly different. One of the logical positivists, Otto Neurath, echoed the last line of the Tractatus, you know, remember, uh, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Otto Neurath said, one must indeed be silent, 
but not about anything. There isn't for them. There isn't anything about which to be silent, and that's a huge difference. But it's a difference that's very difficult, of its very nature, to put into words. Now, the Vienna Circle, when Wittgenstein gave up this ridiculous attempt to be an elementary school teacher, he came to Vienna and was invited to join in uh, the discussions with the Vienna Circle. And when he did so, they were amazed to discover how seriously he took mysticism. And to give them some idea of this, what Wittgenstein did on several occasions was read them poetry. He read them the poetry, poetry of Rabindranath Tagore, the, the Indian mystical poet. Now, how do you get across that difference between Wittgenstein and the logical positivists? You see, their areas of, of agreement are, are, are huge. The logical positivists and Wittgenstein agree that meaningful sentences are confined to those that, in Wittgenstein's sense, in Wittgenstein's uh, uh, terms, picture the world. They are agreed that any attempt to say something that isn't a picture of the world, anything metaphysical, so to speak, anything about ethics or aesthetics or the meaning of life, they agree that any any attempt to say anything about those things is 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 going to result in failure because those things are inexpressible. But they differ on a, on a more fundamental point, which is that for Wittgenstein, those are the most important truths. The things that we can't say are precisely the most important. Whereas for the logical positivist, the things we can't say are just rubbish. How do you get across that difference? Well, it seems to me that one way of understanding that difference is to know something about Wittgenstein himself and that's what prompted me to write my biography of of Wittgenstein the thought that if you understand what kind of person Wittgenstein was the respect that he had for Tolstoy's Gospel in Brief for example one would not be uh, tempted to attribute to him the attitudes of the Vienna Circle one would see that His attitudes are fundamentally different. And therefore, although what he says in his philosophical work will bear striking similarities to what they say in their philosophical work, his work is to be read, you know, you might put it this way, his work is to be read in a different spirit. His work is to be read with a different attitude. And one way of capturing that spirit and capturing that attitude, it seems to me, is to write a biography in which one can one aims anyway to get across something of Wittgenstein's personality, something of his ethical and spiritual preoccupations and therefore something of his attitudes. Now, notoriously Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's work was not continuous or homogenous. Uh, one speaks of the early Wittgenstein and the later Wittgenstein. When Wittgenstein returned to philosophy, which he did, He returned to philosophy because he'd become persuaded that his early work was not right. In particular, he was persuaded that his early work expressed a kind of dogmatism. A dogmatism about logical form. His early work, you remember, was all about logical form and about how logical form is inexpressible. But he now thought it was a piece of dogmatism to think there is a logical form. He had assumed in the Tractatus that there's a single logical form. It applies to the world, it applies to our thoughts, and it applies to language. And it's because of that isomorphic set of structures. It's because language, our thought, and uh, reality all have the same form. It's because of that that we can think thoughts that are true or false about the world and that we can put those thoughts into language. Wittgenstein now, from 1929 until his death in 1951, emphasised not what language has in common, but the different uses of language. He said that in the Tractatus he had assumed that there were just three forms of linguistic utterance. There was a sentence, there was a question, there was an order. So, you say, the door is shut, that's a statement. Is the door shut? A question. Or shut the door? An order. In the Tractatus, he distinguished those three types of 
proposition and said that they clearly have something in common, the kernel of it. The kernel of all those three, the question, the order and the uh, statement is the door being shut. Now he says in, the, in, in his later work, so it's how many, how many you know, kinds of language are there? Statement, question, order. No, he says there are countless times, countless uses of language. Think of telling a joke. Think of expressing one's feelings. Think of describing something in science. Thinking of making up a nursery rhyme. Think of making up a song. There are countless kinds, and they're not all to do with the representation of reality. So in his later work, he pushed further his initial thought that one can't have a theory of logic into a much, a much more fundamental thought, which is one can't have a philosophical theory. In the early work, he had a philosophical theory about logical form, and his theory of logical form was that it was inexpressible. In his later work, he says, no, what goes wrong here, the reason we fall into this kind of dogmatism is that we think that it's the task of philosophy to come up with a theory. And remember in his early work he distinguished what one can say from what one has to show. Now in his later work he distinguishes two kinds of understanding. There is the understanding one gets from a theory, and then there is the understanding which he calls the understanding which consists in seeing connections. The understanding which one gets from seeing connections. What does he have in mind here? All right. Seeing connections. Let's, let's say there's a mother and a daughter. You can see the mother, you can see the daughter, and then you can see the connection between the mother and the daughter. You can see that the daughter looks like her mother. But the likeness that you see is not some third thing. It's not that there's the mother here, there's the daughter here, and now here's the likeness. When you see a connection between two things, you are really seeing something, but it's not something. And Wittgenstein came to think that, that at the heart of almost all philosophical confusion is the assumption that when we talk about something, there is something that we talk about. So, for example, the mind. It's a philosophical question, what is the mind? And people assume that an adequate answer to that thing will be the identification of some thing that is the mind. What is consciousness? All those questions at the heart of those uh, dialogues by Plato uh, that Socrates uh, 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 attempts to answer. What, what, is, what is knowledge? What is piety? What is justice? Now, for those of you who read some Platonic dialogues, you remember that the structure of them a lot of them is the same. What happens is somebody, somebody professes to know what piety is or what justice is or what knowledge is. So then Socrates asks them, what is knowledge? And then they'll give some examples. And then Socrates will say, no, I don't want examples. I want to know the form. I want to know the essence of knowledge or justice. Now Wittgenstein in his later work would say, no, stop there. Stop with examples. That's all you've got. In philosophy, all you've got when you're trying to understand something, the mind, consciousness, justice, knowledge, whatever, is a series of examples, and then it's up to you to see the connections between those examples. And there won't be some essence, there won't be some form. There won't be one thing, like he thought logical form was the one thing that unites thought, reality, and language. There won't be one thing. Rather, he says, it'll be like family resemblances. Think of the members of a family. Some of them will have the same eyes. Some of them will have the same nose. Some of them will have the same walk, the same vocal mannerisms. All sorts of things might connect members of different families, uh, the members of a family. And there won't be some one thing. They won't all have the same eyes. They won't all have the same nose. Rather, there'll be a series of sort of overlapping similarities and dissimilarities. And Wittgenstein, in his later work, says... And that's what it's like with most of the concepts that we're trying to understand in philosophy, including the concept of meaning. There is no one thing that you can identify, logical form or whatever it might be. There is no one thing that gives every linguistic utterance its meaning. There is no one thing that is the mind or consciousness. One has to 
understand the multiplicity, the messy multiplicity of language and resist the temptation to impose a single theory upon it. Now it seems to me also, just as in the earlier work, it helps to understand what kind of person Wittgenstein was in order to understand the spirit in which he wrote his early work. It seems to me too that Wittgenstein's later work is best understood, or anyway, it helps to understand his later work if one understands what kind of person he was. And I think it goes the other way too. I think in his later work, he said some things that are helpful for understanding biography itself. Just as Wittgenstein insists that philosophy is to its very core a non-theoretical endeavour, so it seems to me, so is biography. And that any attempt to construct a theory of biography or to write biography as if it were theory, any attempt to do that misunderstands the nature of biography and precisely because it misunderstands the kind of understanding that lies at the heart of biography. So, the kind of understanding that lies at the heart of biography, the understanding of a person, it seems to me, is not theoretical understanding. It's the understanding that comes from seeing connections. It's the understanding that comes from, as it were, living with somebody, from reading their correspondence, from meeting people who knew them, from reading their work, from um, looking at, you know, considering what they did. Seeing, as it were, the tone of voice in which they said something. That's what's often difficult in understanding somebody. Now Wittgenstein at the end of, uh, he, he, you know, he spent the whole of his later p part of his life trying to articulate his thoughts into a book and he failed. He left When he died in 1951 his major second work was, was unfinished. It was put together from manuscripts and published as philosophical investigations by his, by his friends and, and literary executors. And at the end of philosophical investigations Wittgenstein, having articulated the understanding that consists in seeing connections and having insisted that philosophy is not a science, it's not a theoretical endeavour, he raises the question, is there such a thing as expert knowledge about human beings? For example, is, is, you know, are, are, is there someone who, who, who's an expert on telling whether somebody is genuinely expressing a feeling or whether they're simulating a feeling whether they're pretending to feel such and such and he says yeah some people are better than others at that but they can't give a course in it you can't take a course in understanding people and there aren't some set of rules that you can uh, uh, learn that will allow you to hear the tone of somebody's voice or whatever but nevertheless some people are better at it than others and you can learn from the people who are good at it, but what you're learning is not rules. What you're learning is just judgments, as it were, just learning how they do it, seeing them do it. And he says, what distinguishes an understanding of people from other kinds of understanding is, yes, there is evidence on the basis of which you make your judgment, but he says it's often imponderable evidence. Now, what does he mean by imponderable evidence? He gives examples. A tone of voice a glance, look at somebody's face, what is it expressing? We can answer that question better when we know that person, when we can pick up on the imponderable evidence. Now imponderable here means you can't weigh it, it's not like the kind of evidence you can give for asserting something in physics or in biology. There is evidence, but you can't weigh it, and you can get better at it. And you know that when you're better at it, because now the whole thing fits together. So the biographer's art is the art of seeing the connections between all the various things that somebody did and said. And that's, that's what I tried to do in the case of Wittgenstein. And what I hope is that in doing that in the case of Wittgenstein, I provided one route into understanding Wittgenstein's early work and his later work and... I think, the ways in which his later work can help us to understand biography itself. Okay, thank you.